اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته for the hastening of the reappearance of our master, our leader, our imam, the avenger, the savior. Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjal faraja. Fakid kaydak wasa sa'ayak. وناصب جهدك فوالله لن تمحو ذكرنا ولن تميت وحينا Once again we find ourselves marveling at the words of the captive woman who even under the lashes of their whips spoke words that not only humiliated Yazid ibn Muawiyah, but left him flabbergasted. Yazid was drunk with power, victory, youth, and alcohol. The intoxication, the inebriation was overwhelming. And yet even he could understand that Zainab Bint Ali ibn Abi Talib, Bint Fatima, is mopping the floor with him. And he couldn't even raise a hand. He couldn't even speak back. And while the words of Zainab السلام, flew right over his head, meaning that he couldn't fathom what Zainab was talking about, the truth of the matter is, that even we don't understand what Zainab was talking about. Zainab was expressing divine will, using language, spoken word, that is inherently deficient. Our languages even the most comprehensive, even the most deep and meaningful, and one with the largest vocabulary, the Arabic language, is intrinsically incapable of comprehending things that relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zainab, in these short words, is articulating what is essentially impossible to be articulated using words, letters, and syllables. But the more time progresses, the more humanity understands that Zain was truly onto something. She says to him, Kit Kaidak. Kaid in the Arabic language is a scheme, a plot. In other words, she's saying, 
you can pull any trick from your sleeve that you want. Do whatever you want. Spare no effort. Struggle to the point of your death. By God, not you, not anyone else can take away the love of the Ahlul Bayt, the love of Hussein from the hearts. And so, once again, we find ourselves marveling at these words, thinking Zainab was on to something. Because let's face it, brothers and sisters, the Shia world, the followers of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, have gone through tragedy after tragedy, tribulation after tribulation, challenge after challenge. You see, now it's a worldwide pandemic. But it's not like two years ago, it was any easier, was it? Five years ago, ten years ago. Because there always has to be something that at least attempts to separate us from the remembrance of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. There's always something. Either it's a tyrant like Al Mutawakkil Al Abbasi, alayhi la'ainullah. He used to amputate hands and it got to the point where he would kill one out of every 10 individuals who wanted to visit the shrine of Imam Al Hussein. So it's either a tyrant that goes back a thousand years. Or a tyrant that lives in this day and age, where the followers of the Ahlul Bayt in certain countries aren't allowed to commemorate the tragedy of Imam Hussein. Either that, or it's a systematic campaign of elimination against the followers of the Ahlul Bayt by means of, you name it, bombing their Husseiniyat and Imam Bargas and mosques. If you don't remember, then maybe you're too young or your memory is too short. Go back just 10 years ago and you'll remember the bombings that happened in Pakistan year after year. The bombings that used to happen in Afghanistan year after year. And the constant onslaught and massacres against the Shia in Iraq and elsewhere. It just wouldn't stop. Every single year we had to commemorate the tragedy of Imam Hussein as well as those who were slain in the way of commemorating the Imam. The only difference was the geographic location and the name of the perpetrator. The one constant was the victims. It was the Shia. It was those whose only crime was crying out, Labbayka Ya Hussein. It was those whose only crime was saying, Ya Fatimat al Zahra. That's it. The victim remained as a constant. The variables were the perpetrators, the tyrants, the kings, the terror groups, you name it. So there's always something, whether it's a tyrant or terror groups, bombings, and today it's a global pandemic. So the challenge was always there. We never, in our long history of commemoration, had a period in time, a substantial, sizable period, in which our path to the commemoration of Imam al Hussein was completely unobstructed. And so, it's a new challenge, yes. But does that mean that the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt will stop commemorating Imam al Hussein? You will never recognize just who we are, Ya Yazid. You'll never understand that this family isn't your average family. You'll never understand that Al Muhammad are Alullah. God Himself took it upon the divine deity to glorify them and to ensure that they exist for as long as we exist. 
So alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, brothers and sisters, what a great privilege it is that we're alive, first of all. We're healthy, second of all. We are still on the path of the Ahlul Bayt, and so we will commemorate no matter what until kingdom come, as they say. If it's not in the mosque, it's in a school. If it's not a school, it's out on the, on the, in the street. If it's not in the street, then it's in our homes. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that can stop us from doing this. And it's not like our, the enemy hasn't tried. And so what we say is Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadi lawla an hadana Allah. لَقَدْ جَاءَتْ رُسُلُ رَبِّنَا بِالْحَقِّ The truth has been delivered by God's emissaries and messengers. And the truth is that this is not going anywhere. The style may change. Some of the practices will have to adapt. But ultimately, you can never take out the love of Hussein from our hearts. The enemy should know that. And so stop, stop trying. We should also not take it for granted, brothers and sisters, because right now, right now, in some countries like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, you have followers of the Ahlul Bayt who aren't allowed to do this. And it's not because of the pandemic. They're not even allowed to hold commemorations in their homes. It's a purely sectarian issue, right? You have, I was reading a tweet earlier today of someone who was imprisoned in Bahrain for five years. And he said that while I was in prison, we, uh, we would go through these phases where we want to commemorate the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, but the prison wardens, the guards, they wouldn't let us do that. And so we, will, we would abstain from food. We would go on a hunger strike. Do you know how many times? Within five years, he says, we went on 25 hunger strikes to put pressure on the prison authorities to allow us to commemorate the tragedy of Abu Abdullah al Hussein in the corners of our prison cells. We're not bothering anyone. We're not hurting anyone. So don't take this for granted, brothers and sisters. Many of you live in countries where, alhamdulillah, you have the freedom to practice your faith to commemorate the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt, to engage in your rites and rituals freely. Granted now, because of the pandemic, there are some restrictions and that's fine. But generally, do not take this for granted, inshallah. What I wanted to do over the next few nights, perhaps the entirety of this series, or at least a part of it, is provide a commentary on something that you might find rather surprising. You've all heard, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Ziyarat Ashura. And it is a Ziyara which needs no introduction. I really don't need to talk about the merits and virtues and rewards of reciting the Ziyara. Many of you, Alhamdulillah, already recited on a daily basis. And if you don't, my sincere recommendation is that at least during Muharram and Safar, or at the very least during the 10 days of Muharram, you would recite the Ziyara daily. Even if you can't do it the way it's been prescribed by repeating certain statements a hundred times, at the very least to recite them once and do a Ziyara every single day. But that's not what I want to provide a commentary on. Rather, I want to zoom in all the way on the very last part of the ziyara. Those of you who are familiar with the ziyara will know exactly what I'm talking about. What's the last thing you do? You fall into prostration. You perform what? Sujood. In that sujood, there are two supplications, two prayers that you make. The entirety of Ziyarat Ashura contains about 14 supplications, which would make an excellent 
resource, and incredible material for a lengthy and in-depth discussion. But the two supplications I want to focus on are the ones recited during the prostration at the end of Ziyarat Ashura. You'd be surprised how much can be extrapolated from these two supplications. What do we say when we fall into sujood? The first thing you say is you, you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma laka alhamdu hamd al-shakirin ala musabihim. Then one, once again you say Alhamdulillahi ala azim raziyati. Basically, that translates to Oh Allah, thank you. Laka alhamd. But not just any thanks. Hamd al-shakirin. The status, the level of those who are thankful to you. People come in different flavors, different colors, different stripes, and different statuses, right? You have those who are truly thankful to Allah, and then, have, then again you have people like me. Those who are truly grateful to you. I thank you the way they thank you. Hamd al-shakirin alak ala musabihim. For the fact that I am afflicted by them, I am mourning Abu Abdullah al Hussein. The fact that I see myself as one who is in mourning for Hussein, someone who is Musab. Musab in the Arabic language means one who is afflicted, one who is injured. One who's in pain. There's a difference between people when you attend a majlis fatiha. Or as the Lebanese would say, an usbu'ah. Right? A gathering to commemorate someone who's deceased. A loved one. There's a difference between the people that you find in that gathering. Right? There is the family members of the deceased. And then again, you have friends of friends of the deceased. You might have an employee of a family member of the one who has passed away. The way this person engages with the tragedy is obviously very different to the way the son, the father, the brother, the wife, the husband of the deceased engages with the tragedy, right? We can all relate to that. In this sajda, we say, Oh Allah, thank you the way those who are grateful to you express thanks to you for making me among those who are afflicted, among those who are like the family member of the deceased. That's how I'm mourning. Then to top it up, you say, Alhamdulillah ala azim raziyati. Raziyah also means an affliction, a tragedy. Praise be to Allah. Thanks be to Allah for the great affliction that I'm going through now. Parenthetically, let me mention something which is important. Who narrates Ziyarat Ashura? I don't want to delve too deeply into the chain of narrators, the authenticity and that sort of stuff, because we're beyond that. As far as, as authenticity goes, Ziyarat Ashura is as authentic as they come. Ziyarat Ashura has been narrated by our most qualified and most illustrious and most celebrated scholars of hadith and the greatest jurists of the Shi'i faith. We're speaking about Shaykh al-Saduq ibn Badway. We're speaking about Shaykh al-Tusi, Shaykh al-Ta'ifah. We're speaking about al-Kaf'ani. We're speaking about Sayyid ibn Tawus. We're speaking about Ibn Uluwayh. We're speaking about people whose integrity, 
whose credentials, whose qualifications are beyond the discussion of ignorant folk like me. But how did we receive this ziyarah to begin with? It is narrated by Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al-Baqir alayhi salam. Listen carefully to this. Imam al-Baqir says that I heard my father, meaning Imam Zayn al-Abideen, Imam al-Sajjad, Ali ibn Hussein, who heard his father, meaning Imam al Hussein, who heard his father, Amir al Mu'mineen, who heard Rasulullah say that I heard Jibra'il say that I heard God say that if you wish to visit Aba Abdullah al Hussein on the day of Ashura, then you recite the ziyarah. Meaning that this isn't a regular run-of-the-mill hadith. This ziyarah is what we technically refer to as hadith Qudsi because it's attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's in a category of its own. All of the narrators of the ziyarah are infallible. So, this kind of contextualizes it. Also take note of the fact that Ziyarat Ashura was originally prescribed for the day of Ashura. So if you find yourself thinking, we're talking about affliction, we're talking about me being in a state of utter mourning, and you may not be in that sort of mindset, mindset that's okay. Because we're talking about this Ziyarah being recited on the day of Ashura when Every Shia is in mourning. Now, Allahumma laka alhamdu, hamd al-shakirin laka ala musabihim. Try and memorize these, because we have a lot of work to do with these statements over the next few nights. Alhamdulillah ala azim raziyati. Then you say this. Allahumma rizuqni shafa'at al-Husayn yawm al-wurud. First prayer, and the second prayer, وَثَبِّتْ لِي قَدَمَ صِدْقًا عِنْدَكَ مَعَ الْحُسَيْنِ وَأَصْحَابِ الْحُسَيْنِ أَلَّذِينَ بَذَلُوا مُهَجَهُمْ دُونَ الْحُسَيْنِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Let's take the first portion here. Actually, before that, let's take a step back. These prayers are to be recited in a state of prostration, remember. Why a state of prostration? Because sujood, my dear brothers and sisters, listen carefully. We're trying to build a case for something extraordinary. Sujood is considered an incredibly important part of Salat, perhaps the most important. The number of traditions we have about the importance of sujood about the benefits of sujood, about the rewards of sujood, are just beyond the scope of this discussion. For instance, we have traditions that state, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels that if my slave knew what he or she was getting as a result of them being in a state of sujood, they would never lift their heads up. In other words, at that point when you're in sujood, God only knows what you're getting, how you're being blessed, how this act is translating into indescribable, unfathomable rewards in the afterlife. Number one. Number two. The hadith says, دَخَلَ رَجُلٌ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ A man came to see the Holy Prophet. The Prophet said to him, يَا هَذَا مَا تُرِيدُ what do you want? What do you seek? فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ الْجَنَّةِ I'm just going to cut to the chase, Ya Rasulullah. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. I want paradise. Give me one thing, a shortcut to paradise. فَمَكَثَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ هُنَيْئَ The hadith says the Holy Prophet paused for a moment as if he's getting ready to say something truly important. فَمَكَثَ هُنَيْئَةَ 
ثم قال أعينونا بطول السجود You want paradise? Help me help you by extending the time you spend in prostration. أعينونا بطول السجود That's one hadith, the second hadith. The third one by Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, I believe this one is in the blessed book of Al-Kafi. Our most authentic collection and canon of hadith. The Imam alayhi salatu wasalam says, Adna ma yakunu al-mar'u ila rabbih. The closest person is to his Lord, to his creator, is in the state of prostration. Allahu Akbar. What is sujood? And then we kind of fast track our sujood when we're praying as if we have something more important to go back to. Subhanallah. And if, if that makes you think, well, why? Why is sujood so special? You need to think about the fact that in sujood, you are essentially placing the most noble part of your entire body, the most important part in your body, which is your forehead, on dirt. Not just the forehead, but the tip of the nose because it's mustahab. Something that's called tamrir uh, or ta'fir. Ta'fir is to make sure that when you're in the state of prostration, not just your forehead, not just your face, but your nose is also rubbing against the dirt. If you've noticed, some people have, they take two turba. That's why they do it, because it's recommended for both the forehead and the nose to be at the same flat level. So to have two turba is recommended. Why? Because what you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, I am nothing. The most noble part of my body, my face, is touching the dirt, touching the earth, in an expression of utter helplessness. I am a nobody. Brothers and sisters, this world is what? A few days, ultimately, no matter who you are, no matter who I am, no matter how many titles, accolades, credentials, qualifications, degrees you hang on the wall, no matter what people call you, at the end of the day, as the Holy Prophet says, dunya sa'a faj'alha ta'a. This whole world is but an hour. Because at the moment of death, when you're lying on your hospital bed, looking down the abyss of the unknown and the angel of death clinches his proverbial claws to extract your soul at that moment your whole life is just a flash no matter how many fancy places you've been to how many meals you've had how many encounters how much pleasure how much pain none of that matters it's just it's just a flash Right? That's how you and I think of last year. Just think of last Muharram. It's just a flash. It's just a distant memory. Right? Our whole lives will be just a figment of our imagination and a distant memory when it comes time for us to part from this world. So it really doesn't matter if you're a doctor, if you're a professor, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a CEO, if you're a marja, if you're a alim, none of those things matters. Because at some point, you and I, within days, because even if it's a few years, you can break it down into days. Within days, you and I will be six feet under the ground. Maybe we'll have our names carved on the tombstone. And maybe some family members will come and pay us a visit every once in a while. The day of Ashura is called Qabristan Day. People go there and they do their ziyara of their dead ones. In some cultures, it's the first of Muharram, but that's about it. And then your own grandchildren or great-grandchildren won't even remember your name. 
let alone remember to actually think about you and to send you good deeds. And so in this world that is so transient, as the beautiful hadith puts it, the Imam says, Ad-dunya taghurru wa tadurru wa tamurru. This whole world deceives hurts and passes. That's basically this whole life in a nutshell. So, if this is what life is, which it is, and if life is only a flash, which it will be, and if we are all going to end up in a hole one day soon, which we will, what does it matter then? What you're saying in sujood is, Ya Allah, I am nothing. قُلْ لَا أَمْلِكُ النَّفْسِ نَفْعًا وَلَا ضَرْ Oh Allah, I don't own anything, I don't have anything. All these fancy schmancy titles, all the things that I was proud of, all the things that I boasted about. God forbid you address a doctor with their first name, or a alim with their first name. God forbid people take away your achievements from you. None of those achievements will help you when you're lying in your grave. True? So if that's true, and we all acknowledge and recognize it to be, we have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, I'm a nobody. That's basically what you're saying in sujood. That's what you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the fact that you're here, the fact that you're commemorating Aba Abdullah al Hussein, who do you think gave you that? Did, did you make the decision to do this? Do you think that we can take credit for loving Imam al Hussein? Wallahi, tallahi, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who swayed our hearts towards Aba Abdullah. He's the one who breaks our hearts, He's the one who makes us remember Him. It is Imam al Hussein himself. When you woke up and you decided to attend the majlis or you decided to watch this majlis, it was Imam al Hussein who said, it's the first of Muharram, you don't want to come to me. Everything we have is from them. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his vice chairs. Which is why you need to constantly remind yourself, I am nothing, I am a nobody. La hawla wa la quwwata illa Brothers and sisters, unfortunately, we don't spend time in what matters. We squander our lives and we waste our time on the most petty, trivial things. And the most important thing you and I can do is to learn the knowledge that was left to us by the Holy Prophet and his Immaculate Family. Right? Learn their hadith. I'arifu! Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam is heard crying. I'arifu! Manazil shi'atina ala qadri riwayatihim anna. You wish to evaluate our followers? You want to know who's better than the others? The one metric to do that is to see how much of our words and how much of our knowledge do they possess? And how much of our traditions do they narrate? عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ رِوَايَتِهِمْ عَنَّا وَمَعْرِفَتِهِمْ بِنَا How much do they understand what we left them? These treasures of knowledge, like Al-Kafi, like Bihar Al-Anwar, like the great canonical texts of our ulama and our marajim. Allah al-Majlisi, listen carefully, has an entire chapter in his book, Bihar al-Anwar, 110 volumes, his magnum opus. There is a chapter called Bab Fadl al-Hawqala. Hawqala means la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. It's the dhikr that they've made an acronym for it, and the acronym is Hawqala. Just like Basmala is an acronym for what? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allamatul al-Majlisi, Shaykh Muhammad Baqir Ridwanullah Ta'ala compiled 
a list of traditions from the Holy Prophet and the Holy Household about the merits and virtues of saying la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al al azim and I'll mention more hadiths about it as we move along because this is important why is it important? because the hawqala itself contains so much much of our spirituality can be derived from the hawqala number one and number two because the traditions tell us and arbaab al maqatil narrate أن الحسين كان يكثر من ذكر لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. On the day of Ashura, Imam Al Hussein would constantly say لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. I'll mention two hadiths here. The first is رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله says he says لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله كنز من كنوز الجنة. It is one of this statement is one of the treasures of paradise. Not the treasures of this world, but of paradise. That's one hadith. The other hadith, and I'll come back to, to it a little later. The second hadith is Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says. He says that Ida Tawa Tarat Alaikumul Humun Fakulu La Hawla wala quwwata illa billah. When you are faced with Problem after problem, affliction after affliction, challenge after challenge. The way out is to say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That same hadith that I narrated earlier, I didn't finish it. The Holy Prophet says that it is one of the treasures of paradise. Wa innahu. One of the benefits of saying this is it helps you relieve yourself of 99 afflictions in this world. The least of which is anxiety and sadness. And all of these new diseases that we're suffering from nowadays. Mental health and others. People have physical diseases. They go to the doctor and the doctor says, you stress too much. It's because of your stress that you have hypertension. It's because of your stress that you have Heart disease. It's because of stress that you have this, that, and the other. The Holy Prophet says, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. The Messenger isn't giving you a prescription that you can just go and get from the chemist and eat and relieve yourself of your stress and anxiety and depression. The Prophet is treating the underlying cause, the root cause of depression and anxiety. And as we'll discuss it more, it'll become clearer, inshallah. So, going back to the hadith about the merit and virtues of Hawqala, uh, Imam al Sadiq says that if you are facing too many problems back to back, say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Now, when the Holy Prophet says that it's one of the treasures of paradise, immediately you and I, because our brains are wired like this, what do we think of when I say treasure? We think of gold, we think of silver, we think of gems, we think of stuff like that, right? That's, it's basically because we are so materialistic and life and popular, popular culture and the media and movies and series and cartoons and novels and books of all different kinds and flavors basically have engineered our brain to be like this. To become materialistic. SubhanAllah. They told Umar ibn Sa'd, if you kill Hussein, we'll give you the dominion of Ray. Which nowadays, if you told someone that if you do this, I will appoint you as the prime minister of the country, you don't get as many privileges as you would get by becoming the Emir of an entire region. 1400 years ago because having the dominion of Ray meant that you owned everything you didn't just get a salary and were able to make some decisions which were executive in nature no 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 you literally owned the riches all the taxes that were paid to the governor were owned by the governor he could do whatever he wants with it so the second they told him all you got to do is kill Hussein And what we give you in exchange is the domain of Ray, all of present-day Iran. 
He said, you know what? Amhiluni al-layla. Give me one night to think it over. And of course, you know that the second the person says, give me a night to think about this, he's done. That's it. He's lost the game. You don't think about something as heinous as laying a hand on the son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But that was his price tag. It was this, you know, the money he had to be enticed with. But then, you know, what really pains me is when I think of the fact that 30,000 people came to Karbala, did they each get the dominion of Ray? Did they, or were they promised to become kings of like a large region of land? To get the taxes of this city or that region or this country? No. SubhanAllah. Many of them had much smaller price tags. Many of them were promised just a handful of dates. Just a handful of dates to shed the sacred blood of Aba Abdullah and Hussein. SubhanAllah. But then if you think about it, those who know, know that whether it's the dominion of Ray or a handful of dates, it's exactly, it's exactly the same. Right? Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi salawatullah wal malaika wal nas ajma'een, says in the last part of his famous sermon known as the Shukshukiyah. The very last thing the Imam says is this. He says, Ama walladhi falaqa al dharra wa bara nasma. I swear in the name of the one who split the atom and created the soul. La al faytum dunyakum hadihi azhad andi min aftati anz. To Ali ibn Abi Talib, this entire world is worth less than the saliva that's extracted when a female goat sneezes. Ali says, Wallah la wa'atitu al-aqalim al-sab'a bima tahta aflaqiha. My God, if I were given the seven heavens and everything that's underneath them, seven heavens? Is the Imam speaking about the universe? Is he talking about seven parallel universes? Is he talking about some kind of multiverse? God only knows. He says, by God, if I were given all of this, in exchange for what? So that I would oppress an ant. That I would take, not kill the ant, but take away what the ant carries, which in this case is described as the leaf of a grain, not, the, not even the grain itself. If I were told you get all of this, the kingdom of the heavens and the earth in exchange for this, by God, I, should, I wouldn't do it. And so the question we need to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, is what's our price tag? Do we have a price tag? Right? Because if you have a price tag, even if it's the highest price, it doesn't matter. It's the same as having the smallest price tag. At the end of the day, this world is transient. That's the central message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, that it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. Which is why Lady Zainab alayhi salatu wasalam says to Yazid, Kit kaydak wasasayak wa nasab jahdak fa wallah lan tam kudikrana wa lan tumit wahyana wa lan tablug ghayatana. You can do whatever you want. You can never take this away. Ever. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one who makes every Shia feel uneasy with the beginning of Muharram. Every Shia is like, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable sitting at home. That's why you have this massive global debate right now between the three to five hundred million adherents of the Shia faith about should they attend the gatherings of, of lamentation and mourning, should they do so 
in a communal fashion? Should they do it at home? What should they do? This, that, and the other. This constant struggle because we feel uneasy. How could I sit at home? How could I not commemorate? And so the best way to do this is to go back just a few generations ago. How our forefathers, how our ancestors commemorated the tragedy of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein by holding these intimate family gatherings where the children wouldn't just be spectators, they would be active participants. Let your kids take part in the lamentation. You as a father, as a mother, be the reciter, be the speaker, be the eulogizer. Have one of the kids recite a Laqmiya afterwards. Do it together as a family. I say this to all the people watching this online. We're not news to this. This isn't novel. This isn't something we've never experienced before. We did this for generations on end. But you know what? It's a good thing that you feel uneasy. It's a good thing that you feel uncomfortable. Because wallahi, it means that you are of legitimate birth. Because it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the hadith says, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدٍ خَيْرًا You want to know whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you? There's a simple litmus, litmus test that you can perform at home. If Allah wishes good for a slave of his, قَذَفَ فِي قَلْبِهِ حُبَّ الْحُسَيْنِ وَحُبَّ زِيَارَةٍ that's why I've said this before. Others better than me have said it before. Maraja and ulama have said this before, and I'll say it again. Go back to your parents and kiss their feet and thank them for raising you with the love of Aba Abdullah in your heart. I don't know, honestly. I don't know what is it about you or this sinful slave that is me that Imam al Hussein happens to love which is why he invited us all together to commemorate him to mention him to offer condolences to his mother Fatima al Zahra alayhi salatu was salam you know how it's tradition in many cultures in many um, communities around the world where I'm sure you've heard this before. They say that any gathering for the eulogizing of Imam al Hussein is attended by Fatima al Zahra. I haven't seen a hadith to that effect, but I have seen a hadith where a person by the name of Ja'far ibn Affan, he's a man who was a poet. Imam al-Sadiq is sitting down with a group of companions who are mostly from Kufa, min al-Kufiyin, from Iraq. So as the Imam is sitting down with them, this man, Ja'far ibn Affan, walks in. The Imam called out his name, Ya Ja'far! He said, Labbaik ruhi fidar, Allahu Akbar. I am at your beck and call. May my soul be ransomed for you. Tell me, what do I do? The Imam said to him, Ya Ja'far, Inni sami'tu annaka taqra'u al-shi'ar ala bi Abdullah al-Hussein. Wa tuhsinu thalik. I've heard that you recite well for Imam al-Hussein. That you read poetry for Aba Abdullah. You eulogize him. Is that true? He said, Yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I do. The Imam said to him, Would you recite a few verses of poetry? So he began reciting poetry. We have another hadith where the Imam said to him, Stop, stop. He went and he put up a curtain to separate the men from the women. So the women could more comfortably cry and commemorate Abu Abdullah and his tragedy. He put him behind the curtain and they started reciting. There are so many hadith like this, by the way, which describe the way the Imams of the Ahl Bayt used to commemorate the tragedy of Abu Abdullah. And there are so many valuable lessons in those hadiths. But this is only one of them. So Ja'far ibn Affan started reciting. Fabaka Mawlana Sadiq. The Imam cried. Wabakina. The narrator of the hadith says everyone who was in that gathering started crying for the Imam. Then when he finished, the Imam said to him, Ya Ja'far, 
والله لقد شهدت الملائكة مجلسنا هذا The angels attended this gathering وبكوا أكثر مما بكينا And the angels cried more than we cried Because the angels recognized Hussein The angels know who Hussein is They cried more than we did Then the Imam said to him Ya Ja'far Wallah You have just secured your position in paradise with this recitation of yours. Then the Imam gave a golden rule that we can all apply. Again, going back to the point about holding gatherings and majalis in our homes. The Imam said, Man nashad baytan lil Hussein. If you so much as write one line of poetry, one verse for Hussein, if you so much as recite something that makes people cry for Hussein, if you cry or make other people cry, Paradise is all but guaranteed for you. Allahu Akbar. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt would eulogize the Master of Martyrs. The Imams would cry. Imam Zayn al Abidin alayhi salam. I don't know. To be honest with you, the first night is usually one of the hardest nights because you don't know where to begin from. You don't know whether you should talk about how for 34 years Ali Imam al-Sajjad cried for his father Aba Abdullah. How for 34 years the Imam would walk in the marketplace and if he ever saw a butcher about to slaughter a sheep, he would run to the butcher and say to him, did you quench the sheep's thirst or not? Before you slaughter it, did you feed it any water? So the butcher would say, Ibn Rasulullah, Nahnu ma'ashir al qassabin We as butchers, we never slaughter a sheep without first giving it water. The Imam would then walk backwards until he would rest his back on the wall and say, Amma Abi, as for my father, Faqad dhabahuhu atshanan kama yudbahu al kabsh my father was slaughtered the way a sheep is slaughtered. But you know the difference between him and your sheep is that they never gave him a drop of water. Imam Zayn al Abidin, whenever he was offered any food, he wouldn't eat the food until it was mixed with his tears. If he was offered any drink, he would cry and cry and cry until the drink would attain the taste of his tears. To the point that he cried for 35 years. One day they say, Fatima bintul Hussein, maybe it was Sakina or one of the other daughters of Imam al Hussein, because they were all named Fatima. She came to Abu Hamza Thumali. She said to him, Ya Abu Hamza, we're afraid for my brother. I'm afraid that he would die from crying, from the tears, the tragedy. Would you have a word with him? Would you speak to him? What should I tell him, my mistress, Abu Hamza said. She taught him what to say. Go tell him, Al-Mawtu lana aada wa karamatuna min Allah shahada. Death to us is a habit and martyrdom is an honorific title that we receive from Allah. The Holy Prophet was martyred all the way to the 11th Imam. We're not new to martyrdom. Maybe you could tell him that, console him. We're afraid he would die. Abu Hamza Thumali went to Imam Zain al Abideen. He told him what he was taught. Sayyidi ibn Rasulullah, Al Qatlu lakum aada wa karamatukum min Allah al Shahada, Ama ana li huznika an yanqadi. Isn't it time that you stop crying for your father, Abha Abdullah? What did Imam Zayn al Abideen say? Allahu Akbar. One hadith says, He told Abu Hamza, Yes, you are right that being killed is a habit of ours and it's an honor to be martyred in the way of Allah. وَلَكِنْ يَا أَبَا حَمْزَةً هَلْ سَمْعَتْ هُذُنَاكَ 
Have you ever heard that prior to the day of Ashura that our women would be taken as captives from one town to another town? That has never happened to us, Ya Aba Hamza. What are you talking about? Every time I see my aunts, every time I see my sisters, the Kartu Firahunna min Khaymatin ila Khayma. I would remember them running from one tent to another. Another hadith says that the Imam responded like this. He said to him, Ya Aba Hamza, Yaqub had 12 sons. He lost one of his 12 sons. His son was missing. Yusuf was missing. He wasn't even dead. And yet he cried, he cried until he was blinded from the sadness. And yet, I saw with my own eyes. What did I see? I saw 17 of my brothers and my uncles and my nephews and my father. Lying on the sand of Karbala like sacrificial lambs. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون